This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale and today I have the pleasure of talking to Robert P. Colker and Marsha Gordon on the fifth edition of Robert Colker's groundbreaking textbook, Film, Form and Culture. Uh, the book is a remarkable introduction to cinema in all its aspects, including the history and the physical making of film as well as providing outlines to the major genres and theoretical discussions that go on in terms of our reception of film. Um, in this edition, you find an updated selection of, of examples, and uh, it's been revised extensively and is available also for teachers uh, who can gain, who can... Um, uh, receive examination copies if they go to the Routledge website. I'll put a link in my show notes. We discussed uh, lots of topics, so it's a it's a really interesting discussion. Robert, of course, we had on earlier this year talking about his new Stanley Kubrick biography, and Marsha has written widely on cinema, including ex uh, a book on the uh, work of Samuel Fuller, one of those filmmakers who is growing in reputation, rightfully so. If you enjoy the episode, please remember to um, review if you can, uh, leave star ratings, um, preferably good ones, and uh, do everything uh, you can to um, make it make this podcast um, available to as wide an audience as possible. But before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. So one of the things that um, I think is important to acknowledge is that film, form, and culture uh, began with uh, with Bob Colker. Um, he is the one who wrote this book um, on his own and uh, was first published in 1999. And I've been using it for many years as my textbook and introduction to film. And what I always admired about the book was its elegance of prose, its sophistication of writing, um, its poetic, it's lyrical about film, form, and culture. It's not just a dry textbook conveying information and film titles, and this is a cut, and this is a shot, and this is high key lighting. Um, it is, of course, defining all of these important concepts for an introduction to film class, but it is also modeling beautiful writing. And to me, the fact that this book is a pleasure to read um, should be both inspiring to students who want to think in a sophisticated way about film, but also to anyone who wants to just learn a little bit more about the way film works. And so I think in that way, it is readable. It is the kind of book that if you are a journalist who's just interested in film, you could take great pleasure reading this book. And I'm not patting myself on the back here. This is all um, stemming from Bob and his, um, I think, career long commitment to being a, a beautiful writer about film, not just a writer about film. Uh, which is something we, we want to celebrate on this podcast as much as possible, obviously. Bob, I, I wondered, you know, going back to 1999, of course, at that point in history, teaching film and film education was was not necessarily as, as widespread as it is today, perhaps. Or, or let me frame that more as a question. How, how has uh, the teaching of film and the, the presence of film in colleges and universities and schools, how, how has that changed in, in the past 20 years? five years? Well, even in the late 90s, it was fairly well entrenched. Um, film studies is taught, I think, across the, across the country, across the world now. Uh, sometimes it is linked with media studies, cultural studies, um, all of which are covered in the book. I also wanted to point out and add to what Marshall was saying, that the book started out partially as a 
pedagogical, technical, and licensing experiment um, because the original edition came with a DVD that had film clips um, in it along with um, narration and diagrams and a whole slew of ways to look at the image that complemented the, uh, the written text. And that continued well into the 2000s until clips became widely available online or on DVDs that more and more um, film schools had. This is partly an answer to your question. Uh, libraries of DVDs and Blu-rays are now quite typical um, the way they were not in, uh, in, at the time when the book was full first put together. So now the book is just richly illustrated with uh, with still images, and the instructor is free to supplement them, not with clips, I think, anymore, but with actual films, um, entire films. And if I may add to the question about about introduction to film classes too, and the way film studies is taught globally, it is astonishing how many institutions, and, and I'm not just talking about university, also what we would call high school in the United States. Uh, I often get students, high school, community colleges, um, transfer students um, who have had some exposure to film in their courses. Sometimes it's only part of a course because they don't have a dedicated film studies instructor. Sometimes it's taught very much in a kind of literary studies mode, more analysis without attention to form, the way film is constructed, which is central to this textbook. But I do think that as our culture has shifted more and more to a culture oriented to the visual, to now the streaming, that you know what we used to call media literacy, um, the ability to think about the images that young people are seeing in particular has become more and more urgent. One might even argue a crisis. And so I think teaching young people, teaching all people who have not had the education to think about film and moving images critically, because even though this book is called Film, Form and Culture, as we acknowledge in this fifth edition, William, what is film anymore? There are very few films that are shot on film and shown on film anymore. And right. so as the object of study itself has changed, become more ubiquitous and accessible on the one hand, and also kind of more challenging to access on the other. For example, if I am wanting to teach a film that is uh, a Netflix uh, release, often there's no DVD of that film. I would have to subscribe to Netflix in, a, in order to show it. There's no physical media anymore. And um, I, I, that's a very alarming situation for those of us who um, who teach in this area. But, but there's so much going on with the way um, film and media has changed in the past certainly decade, I feel like there's been an accelerated change um, that, that helping people understand uh, the consequences for that is extremely important. From that perspective, the uh, book uh, very much pushes a point that you need to consider film history, that film was not invented with um, Netflix. Um, and so there's a great deal of uh, time spent on older films, on black and white films, even on silent films. Um, there are sections on Buster Keaton and D.W. Griffith um, just to contextualize history for students so that they can place what they are seeing with other older defining cinematic events. Yeah, I thought I really appreciated those sections. I thought it was really interesting as well how you're looking at people who are really inventing the language and the grammar of cinema. And so when you go back to form, you know, one of the words in your title, it's almost as if really in order to define what we're talking about in terms of cinema, form is maybe the key rather than film, as in the materiality or the celluloid or the you know, the screen. It's it but it, it's it's the way you tell a story. And I think you make a point in the book that there is a delimitation. There is, there are demarcations. There are certain points where a TikTok video is not a film. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that you know, as we updated the textbook, we were 
mindful of these shifts, both in media production, well, I should say in media production, distribution, and consumption, right? No longer just exhibition, now that people are looking at so much of the media they look at every day on their phones or iPads or laptops or what have you, but that some of the fundamental mental principles of the way images are constructed and create meaning do carry over and um and uh, are are relevant to these new forms um that that media is taking today and so while the book is you know um grounded in grounded in film history moving out of that to the contemporary day and one of the things that Bob and I really worked on was thinking about, well, how have genres changed, for example? So there's this genre that didn't exist, uh, you know, until fairly recently, the superhero film, right? This has been somewhat ubiquitous, I think perhaps on the wane, um, but uh, it has been somewhat ubiquitous, but we felt it was important to bring in discussions of that genre, which the students are very familiar with, but also to think about, for example, the way that Wonder Woman you know, the Patty Jenkins film that was such a box office success globally is at its, you know, fundamental base. It's a melodrama. And so we tie it to these much older traditions that, you know, date back you know, to the 19th century in literature and then um, to the early 20th in film so that students can understand that what they're seeing may be a kind of a new, a new genre, but it's an iteration of an old genre. And even the idea of special effects and spectacle that's you can trace to the late 1890s in um in in the work of George Méliès for example the french um magician turned filmmaker and there's even a newer form um called afrofuturism um that is um widespread i mean all the way from the wakanda films to films made in in africa themselves so We've really tried in the space allotted to cover the scope of cinema. You know, and let me add to that, because I think that was a, a really one of the hardest uh, challenges of working on a textbook, which I could never have appreciated until I actually got on the other side of it with Bob, went through the portal of having to make these decisions, is that, you know, for everything you include, you're excluding a hundred other things, right? right? It's a very painful process in some ways, because, you know, both of us have the the things that we really care about and that we tend to teach and want to write about. And then we have to also think about, you know, students who are oriented to different forms of media and how do we balance the canonical with the new? Um, Bob and I are both Americanists um, at heart in many ways. And so um, how do we also think about film in a global context, which it always was, right? It was never an American idea, an American invention. It was happening all over the world. And so as we worked on this edition, one of the things we did was really expand the global sections of the textbook. So now we have, even though, you know, they're far from comprehensive, but we have sections in the edition, this edition on India and Iran and Nigeria and um, South Korea and Japan and Burkina Faso. And so we really um, tried to to be uh, globally mindful um, uh, in an effort to uh, to make it clear that this is uh, this is this is an intro textbook. We are kind of cracking open a door, right, and giving readers an opportunity to be exposed to a lot of things, but hopefully not overwhelmed by too much exposure, which was also another balance we really worked um, to strike so that there's enough depth, but also enough of a gesture towards um, filmmakers and films that we think readers might be interested in pursuing on their own. Yeah, it's sort of the accordion effect to say enough that will then be um, ready to be opened up by the instructor, um, filled in, um, movies shown, ideas expanded, uh, and hopefully students' perceptions expanded as well. And in talking about students, uh, y your experiences of teaching in and using the book in the classroom, Marsha, and, and, and Bob as well, your experiences since, since writing the original uh, version of the book, what... what 
have students sort of taught you? What have, have you received from them that you thought, ah, this is where I should we should direct the book I, or I should I should place the emphasis or this is something that students really respond to well. I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm in a very unusual position right now, which is that I am actually teaching introduction to film this semester with the fourth edition of the textbook that Bob wrote on his own because our edition wasn't available yet, even though it was fully written. It was just going through the, the publishing process. So um, I'm actually really glad it worked out this way because it gave me the experience of, you know, changing up my some of the material I was teaching in the class, which is reflected in the new book, which of course mm. they weren't reading. For example, I taught Moonlight, the Barry Jenkins film. Um, and I, I, what I learned from that is that my students respond tremendously to this film, that mm. about a third of them had seen it before, about two thirds had not, that formally it could not be a bigger gift. It is so well crafted in terms of its attention to things like color, camera movement, sound, all of these kind of great fundamentals of film form that we talk about in the book. And um, it, it's a great uh, film to look at clips from for doing close reading exercises because Jenkins and his cinematographer are and his editor are so attentive to the kind of visual landscape in this film. And so, um, I, you know, that I, I had not taught that in an introduction to film class before. And that was actually a recommendation of one of my colleagues um, when we were casting about for what are some films that you think we should consider including in this edition. And I'm so glad that that made it into the revised edition because the students found it um, innovative, formally beautiful, really relevant in terms of the kind of questions that it raises about um, social inequity, sexuality. Um, and so that was a, a, a nice experience of teaching the new with the old and it worked fine and it'll work even better now that there's a section that they can read about some of that on their own and then come into class thinking about it a little bit um, outside of class. And um, I'll mention one other thing, which is that I did not teach Get Out in its entirety in the class, but I did show the clip that we talk about in the book, which is the opening um, scene from the film, which is just brilliantly constructed. I'm a big admirer of um, of Jordan Peele's uh, 2017 film. And it was such a perfect example of, uh, of a really innovative film form instead of cutting um uh the the camera kind of moves in these uh in these uh, kind of forward and loop loop around motions so that you're getting it breaks the rule doesn't it it breaks the rule and so whenever you can show rule breaking so it's not going to be using shot reverse shot it's not going to be using cutting instead it's using camera movement in order to create a very eerie uncanny feeling and to reveal more to the viewer than to the character on screen. And it's a very easy scene to find. I'm sure on YouTube, there's probably clips everywhere. Um, and so again, that was a great proof of concept that like, here's this, here's this um, just one scene that we talk about in the book that worked so well in terms of asking the students, well, what do you see here? What's different about this than what we've been looking at? How does it sound? It's also sonically very innovative. There's a very irritating little noise. that's kind of like a quiet background, non-diegetic, not from the world of the film noise. But the first time you watch the clip, most of the students didn't hear, right? Mm -hmm. It took watching it a second time. And so anyhow, that was also a very teachable, it, it's, it's good to see the new material working so well in the classroom, even though they're not reading the new textbook yet. It, it's hard to, it, it's very hard to explain and describe the textbook market because it is so big and so filled with competing Voices. So for a while, Film Form and Culture was published by McGraw Hill, who also published Bordwell and Thompson. And so there was this sort of balancing act, or I should say imbalancing act, because certainly Bordwell and Thompson is the film textbook. Um, and here was this little pipsqueak um, coming along and saying similar things in a more condensed way and with a visual, um, active visual component. 
So it was interesting to watch how the book entered this large field and uh, came into its own. I remember having a friend who told me that the most teachable film for him was Don't Look Now, because it just had everything in there, you know, editing, colour, music, acting, everything was there. And it, you could you could almost teach an entire course and just use clips from Don't Look Now. But Bob, I wanted to ask you if there's a particular film that you think has this, uh, illustrates so much that you can um, use it in class. Well- I don't know that there is one film when I was teaching the course, the introductory course. uh, There were a series of films, each one of them illustrating points that needed to be made. Obviously, Citizen Kane. uh, uh, Less obviously, um, 40s melodramas. Um, We have a large section in the book on, um, the name escapes me, um, Warner Brothers uh, 40s. Uh, melodrama. Now that, Voyage. Yeah, yes. Right. Betty Davis and Paul Henreid. And it's films like those that allow the student to grasp the details so that as we move chronologically up to the current period and wind up showing them a film like Taxi Driver, which is in itself a kind of textbook uh of, of film form and film history. Uh, they have um, under their belts, as it were, the foundation for understanding the new. May, may I give this one a, a shot? Because again, having I'm teaching it this semester, so this is all very fresh and relevant to me. Um, after spending a little time and um, talking about film history and the invention of the medium, my um, my opening film for them was Rear Window. And it could not have worked any better. First off, um, many of the students, uh, much to my shock, had never seen an Alfred Hitchcock film. So that was something to learn from that I presume that everyone has seen at least one or two. That is not any longer the case. Um, I don't I think only one of them had actually seen Rear Window um, before. And they were so completely seduced and wowed by this film. They loved it. They had big smiles on their faces when they were leaving the room. They felt like they had just been given this gift. And then it was so tremendously teachable, right? It has got so many things going on with the idea of looking and the gaze, um, with identification, with all of these really important ideas that are fundamental to thinking about why film became such a successful medium in the first place. And so to begin to unpack some of that and to look at the way the camera moves, to look at the way that color is used, um, to look at the way shot reverse shot is used in that film was just, you know, a, a really wonderful experience and a reminder of how powerful a film that is quote unquote old to them, this is ancient history, right? To them, the eighties is ancient history. Um, this young generation. But then kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, I would say six weeks later, I taught Bicycle Thieves, the Vittoria De Sica Italian neorealist film. And I mean, they just felt gutted by this film and Mm. so moved by it. And several of them said, that's my favorite thing we've seen so far, which really surprised me. I thought that would feel a little more like medicine to them (laughs) for Mm. some reason. Maybe it's the black and white. And I know... And, you know, it's not in English, which these are barriers, right, to especially young people that haven't seen a lot of older and um, and non-English language films. But they were so compelled by and astute about what uh, not only what neorealism was doing to um, to what had developed as a kind of Hollywood dominant continuity style, but then also what its legacy has been. So since then, we've looked at um, Jafar Panahi's No Bears. Um, This week, we're doing Wendy and Lucy, the wonderful Kelly Reichert film um, about a girl and her dog. And it's really, uh, it's wonderful to kind of weave this tapestry for them and to kind of share with them these things. I don't, I don't feel like 
students have to love every film that you show them. As a matter of fact, I often find that teaching films that I don't particularly like is as effective as something that I care deeply about. But it is nice also to see them uh, really kind of fall in love with certain concepts through films and certain directors through films and really feel like um, they're being introduced to uh, a time and a place and a way of making films that they didn't know existed before, even though they've seen evidence <laughs> that it exists in, in, you know, in films they're watching today. I had uh, an interesting opposite experience. Um, I showed my class the uh, Chantel Ackerman film, Jean Dielman. Wow. Film that was just voted the best film ever made by the uh, Sight and Sound uh, survey. And I told them that this was going to be a difficult film. I gave them an introduction and put the film on and mistakenly left the room while it was running. And when I came back, maybe a half hour or so later, they were in chaos. They were yelling at the screen. Cut already, they were yelling. Cut, please cut. <laughs> um, and I had to calm them down. Again, explain to them that this was different, that this was the kind of film that we were leading up to, in a sense, in talking about editing, in talking about shot content, in talking about thematic content. And... It didn't satisfy them, but uh, they watched it till the uh, end and I think at least quieted down and <laughs> took their medicine. <laughs> I admire your moxie for, for teaching that film, not not only because, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's so long, um, but it's, I mean, it's such a, um, it's such an extraordinary film. It almost feels like a film that you couldn't teach in a, in a week because mm -hmm. of its, it's scale um, that you would need a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll have the courage to try it one day. <laughs> I, I find that particular film a kind of anti-film in that it does the opposite of a lot of the conventions and and in and therein the value lies. But in showing it to a class, your it, it is that uh, that's that's why I'm uh, not surprised that you're thinking ah I, I maybe this should have gone right at the end of the course because it's almost like here's somebody who knows all the rules and is disrupting them and uh, disrupting all the conventions to get you out of thinking convention. Well, that was the point. Um, if you can lay the ground of convention and teach them, and this is a really important um, theme that runs through the book, that the conventions are just that. They are not given uh, from heaven. That film developed intuitively, uh, filmmaking devices developed intuitively. Nobody had a textbook. Um, they tried out and figured out what worked. The shot, reverse shot, dialogue sequence worked the best. It was easy to set up. It conveyed what had to be conveyed, which was usually exposition. Um, and it became a kind of um, automatic device. So once we teach what is automatic, then we can move to the opposite and say, here's something that knows all the devices and is aware of all the conventions and is going to flout them. But I think, you know, you could say the same thing you said, John, about Jean Dielman, about Psycho, right? What's the convention? You don't kill your heroine off in, you know, the first part of the movie, right? Like the reason that works, the reason it's so shocking is that the convention is that you don't do that, right? So that any great filmmaker who is studied in the conventions knows how to break those conventions to great effect, right? And it's part of why, you know, these things get reinvented and there are surprises and there, you know, there's twists and turns in the way that films um, tell their stories and what happens within them. Yeah, I just want to make absolutely clear, I'm not in any way dissing Chantal Ackerman's film. It's just purely that when you put a film right at the top there, it's yeah. like you're almost saying to people, if you don't watch any films at all, just watch this one. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that that film was meant for that function, let alone, you know, there are films that I put in my top 10 that I would never have, yeah, you know, I put Shoah in the top 10, but I would not say 
number one, this is the film that, you know, the, the, that you typifies everything because it doesn't. Well, um, and, you know, let, let me just speak to that because sure. that's not, it's not um, irrelevant to the, the process of writing a textbook, which is that lists are inherently flawed and problematic because what is the criteria really? What does it mean mm. to say something is the greatest, the greatest for what? For everybody? No. <laughs> the greatest for teaching, the greatest for studying, the greatest for watching on a Friday night, the great, you know, there's all of these different things that just get erased, but it does raise an important question, which is uh, one of canon. And, you know, we talk about Jean Dielman in the book. This is, and I say we in the most uh, generous way to myself, because this is something that has been in the book, um, you know, for, for many years, this was Bob's inclusion. I think we might've expanded on it a little bit, but, but the point is, is that when you are making decisions about what to include in a textbook, I mean, Citizen Kane, you know, remains, but we, you know, shaved off a number of you know significant directors and films in order to make space for bringing in new directors and films. So for every you know Get Out and Wonder Woman and Black Panther and Moonlight that you bring in, um, you know you, we couldn't change the length of the textbook. We couldn't just add a hundred pages, right? Mm. So so um, you know the canon is always shifting. And, you know, Bob, it would actually be interesting to look back at the 1999 edition and like, what are the films that changed over time? You know, what, what got added, what got taken away? Um, and who knows what will come back? I mean, it's, it's really interesting to think about the life of a, of a textbook and how it reflects not only the authors who write it, right? Because we're bringing our, you know, our interests, our knowledge to bear, but then also we're thinking about who's reading the textbook and what their frame of reference is. Because I do think it's important that you uh, that you are teaching new material, but that you're also attempting not to fully alienate uh, your, your reader who may have no familiarity with, say, Rear Window, for example, mm. but knows every, you know, Marvel film, you know, like the back of their hand. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, line to walk. And I, you know, I hope we did it with, with grace. <laughs> we also, I think, seeded the book with, for future textbooks and certainly for future courses, um, in particular, talking about the um, extraordinary rise, elated rise of women filmmakers, uh, particularly in streaming and television. Um, we didn't have space to cover that in great detail, um, but we did mention it and tried to point out this was something that deserved attention. Well, for example, l l if I may, if I may add to that, for example, in the, in this revision of the textbook, when we talk about studio era directors in Hollywood, now the directors are Dorothy Arzner, Ida Lupino, and Alfred Hitchcock. Right, so we are weaving the story of women's contributions to the film industry into you know, the narrative of film history, which is as it should be, even though we also have to acknowledge that women were very intentionally excluded from the studio system. So I think it creates an interesting tension that we wanted to try to kind of play out for the students. So it's not a buried part of the history. It is just a fact of the history and acknowledging, you know, the, the kind of process of change in terms of things like gender equity, for example. And uh, implying um, that the change is away from the theatrical feature um, and moving slowly, painfully um, into the streaming platform. Jane Campion's Power of the Dog um, would not exist were it not for Netflix. And this is an extraordinary film on so many levels, on generic levels, as a rethinking of the Western, um, on levels of gender, um, and on the level of the fact that it was done by a strong woman filmmaker and got a, the kind of distribution that it would never have had were, were it theatrical, theatrically shown only. You know, the same could be said of Ava DuVernay's 13th documentary, which we also talk about in the textbook, right? This is all tied into contemporary media history and Netflix's um, influence and impact on that industry, right? To And the, the access to audience that you have 
through Netflix or it has been, right? Netflix has been struggling, um, thriving in the pandemic. And now the streamers are all trying to figure out how to stay alive. I mean, in 10 years, uh, will there be, what, what will the media landscape be, right? We don't, we don't know. We can only see what's in front of us and maybe predict a little bit about what's right, what is right around the corner. But it is undeniable that, um, that Netflix has had a tremendous impact on, on the past decade or so of, of, uh, filmmaking. What I love as well is the sense of, I think Bob mentioned it earlier as well, the sense of film history, but uh, of uh, also from a sort of physical point of view, you know, uh, film literacy is about knowing what is done because that's easy to do physically or on the ground or, you know, the, the, the talking earlier about the, the dominance of reverse shot because it's an easy way of setting up. I was, I remember a director telling me once that they love the French reverse the um somebody staring doing the dialogue straight to camera and then you don't swap the background you swap the character and it looks like they're talking to each other and that's uh that i, I once you once you hear that and you see some films you go ah they they're especially independent movies they're using that so i think grounding the the thing that's interesting in the textbook is grounding uh, a knowledge of film also in sort of how films get made because sometimes the discourse about films you know the role of the producer and, and such like it isn't particularly realistic and, and it, it isn't particularly fair yeah well one of the things that i've always appreciated about this book which um uh, you know, has carried over and, and been updated in some ways, but structurally really um, uh, is Bob's invention, I believe in the first edition, is the outlining of all of the creators uh, mm. that go into making a film, right? So we have this storytellers of film series of chapters um, where we talk about the creative craftspeople and the cinematographer and the editor and the sound designers and the composer and the screenwriter and the producer. And then we talk about acting, screen mm. acting, right? And we talk about the history of different methods for acting and for, for performance and how that's translated at different times that acting in the 1950s stylistically was very different than contemporary acting. Um, and then we take a whole chapter to talk about the director and to talk about the history of that particular role, right? That was also, that has changed a lot over time, really different in the 19 teens than it was during the studio era where the director for the most part in the American studio system, you know, was given assignments and didn't have a lot of creative control over what came out the other end. That was all in the hands of the producer to the contemporary day where, you know, depending upon the context of the film being made, um, directors can have a, a lot of control, like in the example of someone like Kelly Reichert, who is financing truly independent films um, to filmmakers who are really kind of under the thumb of the financial interests of a kind of corporate conglomerate. So uh, I think it's really important to take the time in this book to delineate some of those things, um, uh, to demystify some of those credit lines. I mean, when you watch the credits now in a film, you know, you can take a good 10 minutes to get through those credits, right? There are a lot of people who work on films and that I think is important also in relationship to another key concept in in film studies and um, and certainly is discussed in every introduction to film class, which is the auteur and this romantic idea of the director as the author of his or her um, his or her films. And we spend a lot of time in the textbook talking about why that was historically important um, to imagine the director as a creator and also to acknowledge that it's a myth and a fiction because filmmaking is so inherently collaborative. There are so many people involved in the making of a film. There are very few films that are really the sole creation of an individual. I was just thinking about that recently because I was watching Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis is getting a lot of there's rumors about it. It's being shown yep. and it's probably going to turn up in Cannes in, in a few weeks time. And I was thinking of Coppola, I might be totally wrong about this, but I was thinking of him as sort of someone who is often put in the, the club of the auteurs, but really kind of isn't. He's kind of, his best films are, are very, very collaborative. They're very, very, you know, Apocalypse Now with John Milius and Michael Herr and people like that. And um, Godfather with Mario Puzo and the 
his amazing cast. I'm not sure. That that's just uh, I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> if you if you want to come and and give me a punch for that idea, I'm quite. Um... Well, there are filmmakers um, who shine through a few films and then either the shine the light goes out or um they just begin making ordinary films um i, I haven't seen the latest capola of course but certainly here's a person a director who made three uh terrific films the two godfathers and the conversation uh especially the conversation which is a remarkable uh piece of work and then you know, made a grand opera war film with Apocalypse Now and sort of then did, to my mind, ordinary work. So the auteur theory has uh, its interesting twists and turns. But it is a very convenient and useful way to study film, right? And that's why it has sustained itself. I mean, I have taught classes, for example, on uh, Nicholas Ray, Sam Fuller, and Douglas Sirk. And yeah. it's very convenient to say, okay, here's three, you know, American, well, not born American, but American directors in this period of time, working in very different ways in different contexts, um, coming at issues from different perspectives, formally very radically different. And it's very useful. And it's very, um, I think the students and, and those of us who teach and write about film can often uh, wrap our heads around things because of the auteur theory. It gives mm-hmm. us a container. And um, uh, and even the way Bob just very elegantly went through his um, thinking about Coppola, I mean, that's a perfect example, right? It, to say that someone is an auteur does not mean you know, that every single one of their films is a masterpiece. That's not the point. It's besides the point. Um, but it is to talk about about the way that their career um, and their interests have informed the films that they've made over a over an arc of time. Yeah, I think, I mean, I got the feeling it was a little bit more than that in the sense that the idea was that each individual film, you would get the DNA of the author would be there. And I find it difficult to find the DNA of, Jack and the DNA of the Godfather as being at, of the same filmmaker, and the you know it's missing too much DNA, which which is probably the other no, that 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 metaphor has gone on too long, <laughs> which is the other collaborators and the other and even just the historical cultural moment that he was a part of in the 1970s and 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 not a part of uh, to. To, to a great extent, maybe with the exception of Dracula in the 80s and 90s. But um, one thing I did want to ask about as well is I, I had a great experience uh, um, early uh, late last year of going to the Tallinn uh, Black Knights Film Festival. And I was participating on some panels there uh, where they were talking very specifically about education and film literature. Um, and they had a really vertical sort of structure of primary school through the entire school system to college and beyond. Not only of practical sort of learning how to use film, uh, but how to watch film. And one of the arguments they had for uh, why we need film literacy to be part of the stu- school curriculum was because you're also creating your future audience that it's not just about um, higher level students who are going to write their doctorates and whatnot, but it's also just about kids having the capacity to to have a broad appreciation of film. Uh, what do what do you think of that as a, as a sort of notion? Is that something? Well, I think I think at base, um, a good intro to film course is the same as a good literature course. Um, it teaches students how to think how to put things together, how to understand history, how to see context, um, how to understand that um, a film just doesn't drop from heaven, that it is made um, not only by individuals, but by the history that surrounds it, and um, therefore serves a very interesting function beyond simply teaching an appreciation of film. I will add that I, I I'm always fascinated when I get the rosters for my classes to scan who they are. What mm. major are they? What's their minor? What year are they? And I mean, this semester I have engineering, computer science, biology, in addition to film and English and philosophy. 
and history and zoology. And I have students from all over the university. Uh, of course, introduction to film classes often fulfill some kind of a prerequisite or um, you know something within the university. In my case, it's they have to take a visual studies class. It also fulfills a global knowledge co-requisite because it's so global in orientation. But I, I often find myself um, most interested in the way these students come to me and what they take out of the class and the way they learn, you know, often if, you know, engineering students at my institution at North Carolina State University basically get one elective, you know, that's free. Mm -hmm. And if they're taking this as their elective, what of all the classes in the university, what makes them come to it? And the answer is a version of that they have always loved movies and they want to understand them, that they have no idea how they're made or how they construct meaning, why they, why do they feel scared when they watch A Quiet Place? Why do they, you know, these, I, I would say important questions about the way media works on us, right? And there are very dark reasons having to do with propaganda and social manipulation that it's really important to understand these things. But so I really appreciate when those students come into my classes, even though I know this will probably be the only time they study film, they take it that seriously. I do think that even taking an introduction to film class sends them out into the world and into their lives as scientists or, you know, technologists or accountants or whatever it may be, uh, just with a more savvy and sophisticated understanding of something that they will continue to engage with for the rest of their lives, right? This is going to be part of their lives. And, you know, maybe they get to be that wonderfully um, articulate person after the movie when they go there with their friends or families and, and helps have a conversation about what what's just been seen. And so I think those kinds of ripple effects, um, I think they're actually significant. And I love the idea of this being part of a, a, a curriculum that goes back earlier into students' educations. I, and there's certainly, I've heard of nothing like that in the United States. Um, but I love that there are countries, there are institutions, um, you know, thinking about how to propagate that in their own cultures. You're talking about the future, and you've, we've talked about uh, several times about the future in this conversation, the changes in terms of people. The con you know, there was a time, it was like, um, even I think in my memory, where it was a little bit like Aristotle, who had, uh, according to legend, read any every book that was in existence at the time. Uh, and we were like that about films back in the 80s. It was kind of possible to have watched more or less everything you know what i mean that you had that canon that was that was readily there and was was containable nowadays it feels like every year we're creating more and more films and we're opening up so much globally that we're what the you know uh noddy wood and tollywood and uh bollywood have uh a create it is becoming almost impossible to but at the same time it, it's so rich and so wealthy so are we looking at the future in a way which is is incredibly hopeful in terms of how cinema continues or is it going to change beyond recognition and we're going to be talking about something else in another 100 150 200 years time first of all there is there is there must be a terrific mel brooks joke in the notion of aristotle reading every book that was ever written um will it change of course it will change um it's changing as we as we look at it now um, theatrical movie going, while it has revived since the pandemic, is still not great. At the same time, there are filmmakers, Christopher Nolan, for example, who insist on a strong theatrical placement of their films, and that somehow the uh, the full effect can only be gained by watching it on a big screen. One can argue that. Um, but I think we know who's going to win and what's going to win. And what we try to do in the book is to present all of those possibilities, to not only talk about the past and the present of filmmaking, but to indicate that there is more change afoot. Yeah, speaking of that, I was just, I spent the past four days at the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And um, one of the films that... Uh, 
that played at the festival is called Eno about Brian Eno, the musician, composer, producer. Roxy um, Music. Uh, that's right. Directed by Gary Hustwit. And um, it is uh, it was phenomenal. And the way that it is exhibited is fascinating. And it made me realize how much we don't know about what's to come, which is that the film consists of all of these units. There's a beginning and an end that's baked into the film. And then at each performance of the film, the content is AI generated within a matrix that the filmmaker has created software that that makes these decisions. So it will never be seen the same way twice. It will never be played the same way twice. Um, there are certain rules baked into the documentary. And um, this is such a, a, a lovely homage to Brian Eno's inventiveness, right? So it's very appropriate. This is not like, I'm not saying like, oh my gosh, every movie is going to be made <laughs> this way, but just in terms of what technology facilitates that couldn't have happened, you know, two years ago, right? A year ago, even now here's a possibility. It is interesting in this context. Would you want to do this with every film? No, but maybe, maybe there's a future where film is more interactive, right? This has been a promise that film has held out at various moments in history. Maybe there's a way in which it is um, it is less uh, structured and fixed. And so I was just intrigued by, you know, it was kind of like cracking open another door, like, okay, well, that's an interesting concept. Maybe this is the only film that will, will ever be made this way. Or maybe I just saw something that gestures towards a, a way that um, that moving images might a form, right, a, a, a fungible form that is uh, appropriate for telling certain kinds of stories. So the point is, is we don't know what's to come, right? We know certain pathways, but there's many things that have not yet happened, and um, it's exciting to think about, you know, what innovations are are around the corner. And I just hope that the movie theaters do indeed stick around. And I'm I'm given hope by the fact that my students seem to really love seeing movies in movie theaters. Um, if we can just get some better movie theaters and a better exhibition context instead of just mall multiplexes. Um, and better movies. And better movies. <laughs> Actually, last year was, I think, a pretty decent movie year, all things considered. Yeah. I saw a lot of good stuff last year and a lot of smaller budget, smaller scale um, movies that were not, you know, on the um, in the superhero ginormous budget, constant spectacle, too fast editing mode. I would also say that um, the expansion of people's horizons beyond Hollywood is always a good thing when it comes to the old better movies argument, because I've just watched the new Quentin Dupieux film uh, mm -hmm. from France, and there's a film, The Settlers from Chile, and there's, uh, you, you know, The Teacher's Lounge from Germany last year. Uh, and there are just La Chimera, La Chimera from Italy. Alice Rohrwalker was extraordinary. And uh, I just think, you know, if you if you don't want superheroes, there's literally everywhere else in the world you can look and 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 find other things, you know. The, and also, there was an article in the New York Times, I think, saying that IMAX might well be the future of cinema simply because it's so different to um, your home experience, and it, it and it, it it's a continuing success story that people, when they go to the cinema, want to go to see films in IMAX. Totally possible. I I would not throw down one way or the other on that. That's a very specific a very specific context. So I'm not sure how ubiquitous that could be. A lot to do with the production uh, costs as well. Um, listen, Marsha uh, and Bob, there's one last thing I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to mention as well, because uh, we mentioned his name earlier, and of course he passed recently, David Bordwell. Uh, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, uh, uh, being in the same field as David and having, uh, you know, writing a textbook in the context of uh, David's work as well. Um, and just, just get your thoughts generally on that. Oh, David played the role of public intellectual really well. Yeah, I mean, he, he was uh, uh, so responsible for... Um, for bringing a, a, the discipline of film studies into a more mainstream public realm. And so, yeah, all 
all kudos to Boardwell for taking on that role. As Bob and I both know from the writing that we've done that's oriented to a general audience, such as his recent biography of Stanley Kubrick, which is amazing, by the way. Yeah, and um... we, we've, we've had an episode on that already. <laughs> and uh, I think Robert, Bob will, will, will say there's been a huge spike in sales since the podcast has been released. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good. But so we've both, you know, uh, written books for a, um, for a general readership. And um, it's a lot of work to engage with the general public. And so Boardwell really did, I, he did a phenomenal job mm -hmm. um, with orienting um, a lot of his intellectual energy outside of the academy. And so, yeah, so it's an honor to be, uh, you know, writing in the same space. Circling right back to what we started at the beginning, it's, uh, you know, I think it's in, incumbent on uh, writers on film, writers who are writing about filmmakers to to include that elegance, which you spoke about at the very beginning, Marsha, uh, in their own writing. So, you, you know, you can't really criticize other people if you're not paying care and attention to the thing that you're doing and supposed to be doing well. So uh, it's wonderful to have this uh, film form and no, I've got it wrong, haven't I? It's film forming form culture. culture. Ah, film forming culture. There you take go. Take it. No, take it from the top. Go ahead. No, okay, <laughs> film forming culture. Uh, it's a a brilliant book, and it is a, a really a, a great book to read, even outside of any any educational context. Just as a popular a popular introduction to film. Well, thank you, and I I, I just want to mention that if anyone is listening to this who is a professor of film studies, if you go to the Routledge website, you can order an examination copy of the book for consideration in your classes. And you can also see some of the um, the web content that um, that is up there, including um, what I think is a pretty amazing glossary resource uh, on the website. So yeah, it's excellent. Uh, brilliant, brilliant work, guys. Uh, very well done. And I hope to talk to you at some point in the future. Thank yes, you so much, John. We appreciate it.